Great. Well, I'm really thrilled to be here. And my goal today is to provide an overview of the law in the U.S. and some of the trends that we're seeing in surrogacy legislation in the U.S. Um, so surrogacy has been and continues to be a contested issue in the U.S. And as a result, the law in the U.S. is mixed. We have some states that prohibit surrogacy, some states that permit and regulate surrogacy, and a number of states that have yet to weigh in, have no legislation addressing surrogacy. But that said, while the law is surely mixed in the U.S., the very strong trend in the last 15 years is in favor of legislation that permits and regulates surrogacy. But before I talk about these more recent trends, I want to start by talking about some of the early history in the U.S. So national attention in the U.S. was really brought to bear on surrogacy in the 1980s uh, with the contested custody dispute uh, related to the Baby M litigation that probably many of you are familiar with arising out of New Jersey. This was a custody dispute between a traditional or what I'll refer to as a genetic surrogate uh, Mary Beth Whitehead and intended parents, William and Elizabeth Stern. And the case really spurred the first wave of surrogacy legislation in the U.S. And most of this first wave of legislation was legislation prohibiting surrogacy. And among these statutes, many of them rendered any surrogacy agreements, uh, uh, said that they, the agreement itself was prohibited, Many of the statutes also expressly provided that any covered agreement was void as a matter of law. And some of the statutes even provided that there could be civil and in some states criminal penalties associated with people who were involved in surrogacy agreements. And in this first wave of legislation running from the 1980s through the 1990s, um, feminists and reproductive rights advocates were actively engaged in the policy discussions regarding surrogacy. And indeed, they were some of the most active advocates in this conversation. And surely, um, the feminist position was not uniform. There were feminists who opposed, feminists who supported surrogacy. But the dominant public position of feminists at this time was to oppose compensated surrogacy. And there are a number of different justifications for the opposition to compensated surrogacy at the time. At this time, in the very early years of surrogacy arrangements, there was a fear that many of the people serving as surrogates would be low income and as a result exploited in these arrangements. Some feminists raised concerns that permitting surrogacy arrangements reinforced the view that women's roles were primarily related to their sexual and reproductive capacities. Some opponents raised concerns that people acting as surrogates might come to regret decisions that they made. And then, of course, there were also concerns, beliefs that um, the children and society in general might be harmed um, as a result of compensated surrogacy. And due in part to the active engagement of feminists, again, most of these early statutes did prohibit surrogacy arrangements in the US. But as I said, in more recent years, we have seen a really dramatic shift and what we have seen is um, an almost uniform shift in favor of legislation that permits and regulates at least some forms of surrogacy. Indeed, every statutory scheme that has been enacted in the last 15 years has been a, a statutory scheme that permits and regulates at least some forms of surrogacy. And the states on this list um, really run the political spectrum, so they range from the very deep blue state of Washington to the most recent state, the very, very deep red state of Oklahoma, um, just passed legislation permitting some forms of surrogacy. Um, and a number of the states on this list that now permit and regulate surrogacy are states that previously had statutory pro uh, provisions banning surrogacy. And there are a number of reasons why we have seen this shift in the US. Um, first, at least some of those original concerns that I uh, listed before have not borne out, or at least they have not uh, developed to the degree that people had feared. So while it is true that people acting as surrogates tend to be less affluent than intended parents, for the most part, they tend not to be in dire financial circumstances. Um, second, many, although certainly not all, 
of the people acting as surrogates have reported that the experience was a positive one, or at least not a highly negative one. Third, there's a growing appreciation that banning surrogacy does not end the practice. I think we've heard about that today. Um, instead, what often happens is it either just drives it to other parts of the country or other parts of the world, um, or it pushes it underground. And it's actually when that happens that we're seeing some of the most exploitive and concerning practices. Um, fourth, I think some former opponents have come to believe that if what the goal is is to better protect the people who are acting as surrogates, that a more effective way of achieving that goal may be to permit and regulate surrogacy and to include important safeguards in that legislation. And then finally, I think there's a growing ap appreciation among at least uh, some, some feminists that some of the arguments that have been used to oppose surrogacy are quite similar to arguments that are used to oppose other types of reproductive freedom for women. Um, and this is particularly true with regard to claims about women being coerced by male partners um, and also claims that women may come to regret decisions they, that they make to enter into surrogacy agreements. And so for all of these reasons, as I said, the legislative trend has been in favor of uh, enacting statutes that permit and regulate surrogacy. Um, under these permissive regulatory regimes, um, the, the most statutes recognize that where the parties to a compliant gestational agreement have complied with the rules, that the intended parents will be recognized as, a, as the parents of the resulting child. And increasingly, statutes are providing that this is true often as a matter of law or by operation of law. Um, and so what this means is that people can go to court and get an order declaring the intended parents to be parents and most people do as a matter of practice because it's helpful to have that order, um, but often they're not required to do that, that they simply are recognized as parents as a matter of law. And this is true, for example, in Washington State, which had been a state that prohibited compensated surrogacy for many, many years, um, but last session, Washington State enacted a statute that permits and regulates surrogacy, and it went into effect in January of this year. And this rule, assigning parentage to the intended parents where the parties have complied with the rules is consistent with the rules that apply in other situations involving non-surrogacy assisted reproduction. That is, for non-surrogacy assisted reproduction, the persons who have deliberately brought a child into the world through assisted reproduction typically are recognized as the parents of that resulting child. Um, and while this approach, when applied to surrogacy specifically, certainly is not uncontroversial, um, the benefits of having this kind of a rule is that it provides all the parties with certainty and clarity about their legal status. Um, if they comply with the rules, the parties have assurance that the law will reflect and reinforce their intentions about who will be the parents of the resulting child. And importantly, it ensures that the child will not be left parentless. <laughs> Um, in addition, in some states, including Washington, um, parties are permitted to get pre-birth orders, um, declaring that the intended parents are the legal parents of the resulting child. Um, but I do want to note that importantly, um, typically in states that allow these pre-birth orders, the statutes um, make clear that the parentage does not arise until a child is born. And that's because there is no uh, human being that exists to which parentage could be attached until there is a child that exists. Um, and allowing these kind of pre-birth orders, as I think probably many or all of you know in, in a room, can um, be very helpful. They facilitate the sort of mundane but really important tasks um, that need to be attended to with regard to the birth of a child, making sure the child has health insurance, making sure the birth certificate is properly filled out. Um, so as I just said, in many states, the intended parents to a compliant gestational surrogacy agreement are treated in law as the legal parents of the resulting child. In a very small number of states, there are very few requirements that must be met for that agreement to be compliant. Um, so I would put California in this category. There are very few requirements that must be met to have a compliant surrogacy agreement. Essentially, the parties have to be represented by counsel, and the, the agreement has to be executed prior to pregnancy, um, but that is 
that's about it, um, <laughs> to have a compliant agreement. And I would put California, I would, I would describe it consistent with the title of this panel, the sort of free market approach. Um, but California is a minority. <laughs> I would actually describe most permissive states in the US as permissive regulatory regimes that include quite a few more requirements for that agreement to be uh, an enforceable agreement. And I want to spend time now drilling down into some of the trends that we're seeing in these permissive regulatory regimes in the US. And um, so one trend that we're seeing in the US um, in these permissive regulatory regimes is a trend in favor of more inclusive rules about who the intended parents can be. So in the past, um, some states that permitted and regulated surrogacy limited enforceable surrogacy agreements to situations where the intended parents were a married couple. Um, and of course, at this time in 2001, same-sex couples could not marry, so that meant it was limited to different sex married couples. Um, and these limitations worked not only to reinforce bias and discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender couples, um, but they also reinforced the stereotype that families consist always of one mother and one father, parties who perform different roles and different functions within the families. They also, of course, reinforced negative stereotypes about non-marital families who were not entitled to enter into enforceable agreements. And then, probably most importantly, these rules harmed children, children who were born to couples that didn't comply with these rules, who then um, may not have legally recognized relationships with the people who were indeed functioning as their parents. Um, increasingly, though, what we're seeing is that more recently enacted statutes now permit agreements involving any two intended parents, regardless of sex, sexual orientation, or marital status. So again, this is true now in Washington state, um, and this is now the majority trend in the US. And by moving towards these more inclusive intended parent rules, um, the statutes hold all people accountable for their deliberate procreative behavior. And in so doing, they provide greater certainty and security to the parties who are involved in these agreements. And um, the second trend that I wanted to highlight is a trend in favor of rules that provide greater protections for the people who are acting as surrogates. Um, so as I said earlier, surrogates, at least in the US, tend not to be poor, but nonetheless, they do tend to have fewer financial resources than the intended parents. Um, and moreover, as compared to other forms of assisted reproduction, surrogacy does involve significant health risks to the person who is acting as a surrogate and of course, it involves a more serious and more lengthy bodily intrusion than other forms of assisted reproduction. And so in appreciation for these realities, we're beginning to see a movement in favor of statutes, again, that provide more protections for the people who are acting in this role. And one protection that is increasingly common is a requirement of legal representation. Oops, sorry, I think I skipped ahead. Um, legal representation for parties. Um, there we go. Um, for parties engaged in these requirements. Uh, some of the earlier schemes didn't require any legal representation at all. Um, other uh, other um, early statutes might have required a legal consultation, but nothing beyond a legal consultation. And so if problems arose after that initial consultation uh, arrangement, then the, it left the woman vulnerable. Increasingly, though, enacted schemes almost always require independent legal representation for all of the parties involved in the agreements. And increasingly, statutes are requiring legal representation throughout the surrogacy arrangement um, from start to finish. Um, and it's also increasingly common for the statutes to require the intended parents to pay for counsel for the people acting as surrogates. Um, to be sure, this requirement of independent legal counsel and certainly a requirement that it continue throughout the arrangement increases the cost of uh, the arrangement. And that I think is something to be attentive to because surrogacy is out of reach for many people. But nonetheless, what many policymakers have determined is that weighing um, significant concerns uh, results in drawing the line in this way, requiring legal representation and requiring it throughout the arrangement. We're also seeing a shift 
um, with regard to protections for the bodily and decision-making autonomy of people acting as surrogates. So in the past, it was quite common to see statutes that expressly permitted the curtailment of the bodily autonomy interests of the person acting as a surrogate. So for example, there are actually quite a few states in the US that have statutory provisions that expressly permit, uh, and some states actually expressly require, the person acting as a surrogate to undergo all uh, recommended medical exams, treatment, and fetal monitoring procedures. And there also are a number of states that allow for enforcement of provisions that regulate her behavior in all kinds of ways during her pregnancy. But some of the more recently enacted statutes have rejected that kind of approach. So for example, the more recently enacted statute in Washington state provides that the agreement must permit the person acting as a surrogate to have full decision-making autonomy regarding herself and her pregnancy and that any provisions in the agreement to the contrary are void and unenforceable. And for many women's rights and reproductive rights advocates, this shift is absolutely critical. Um, and indeed, I think this shift in legislative language is due in no small part to the robust re-engagement of feminist and reproductive rights advocates back into the conversation about surrogacy in the US. Um, so women's rights advocates are really key players and the legislative process in Washington state that resulted in Washington moving from a state that bans surrogacy to a state that permits and regulates surrogacy. Uh, women's rights advocates were also very, very engaged in the process in New York this session. We're we'll following. New York has banned surrogacy since 1992. Um, there was a strong push to enact a provision that would have regulated and permitted surrogacy in New York. And again, women's rights advocates were very, very active um, in that conversation in New York. And as a result, while the legislation did not pass, um, it was amended throughout the session, and by the end, the legislation would have provided the most robust protections for people acting as surrogates um, of any legislation in the US. Um, third, again, as a result of um, pushing and urging from women's rights and reproductive rights advocates, we're also seeing more states in the US regulate <laughs> surrogacy brokers, so third parties that connect people acting as surrogates and intended parents. In the past, surrogacy brokers remained almost entirely unregulated in states that permitted and regulated surrogacy, but that's beginning to change. Um, so we have a small but growing number of states in the US that now expressly regulate surrogacy brokers. Um, the fourth trend that I wanted to highlight is um, much more emergent, but nonetheless, I think, important to highlight. And that is, um, based on the Uniform Parentage Act of 2017, we now have two states in the U.S. that have provisions governing the ability of children that were conceived through assisted reproduction to access information about their gamete providers. Um, to be clear, there's no state in the US that currently requires disclosure of information about gamete providers. Instead, what these provisions do is they require people who are providing gametes to sign an affidavit either of identity disclosure or identity non-disclosure. If they sign an affidavit of identity disclosure when the child turns 18, the collecting bank must provide that identity information to the child. Um, and it does require the collecting bank to disclose non-identifying medical information, um, regardless of what kind of affidavit the provider signs. And then the first, the, the fifth trend that I wanted to highlight is one that I think is um, still quite a bit in flux, and that is the differential legal treatment of genetic or traditional surrogacy on the one hand and gestational surrogacy on the other. So I had mentioned that we've got this very strong trend in favor of statutes that permit and regulate surrogacy in the US, now it's 17 states, um, but only six of these states permit and regulate genetic surrogacy. Two of them only permit genetic surrogacy if the person acting as a surrogate is a family member. Um, and then the four other jurisdictions, while they permit genetic surrogacy, they have different rules that apply to genetic surrogacy, specifically with regard to 
the right of the person acting as a surrogate to terminate the agreement. Typically, in permissive regulatory states, the agreement is binding once pregnancy has occurred, but in these jurisdictions, the person acting as a surrogate, if she is a genetic surrogate, um, has the right to withdraw her consent until a later point in her pregnancy, or possibly in three of the states, until some period of time after the child has been born. And there obviously are a variety of reasons. Sounds like a number of other countries draw this distinction between genetic and gestational surrogacy. Um, and indeed, actually, the Uniform Parentage Act of 2017, um, for which I served as a reporter, also draws this distinction. It treats genetic and gestational surrogacy differently. I do, however, think that this is an issue that does warrant additional conversation and consideration. Um, obviously, genetic surrogacy it does not require IVF. It is a more simple medical procedure. Um, that means it's a little bit less expensive than gestational surrogacy, which means that it is within reach of some people who might not otherwise be able to afford gestational surrogacy. Um, and because, again, it does not require IVF, genetic surrogacy subjects the person acting as a surrogate to fewer medical risks. And it also doesn't require someone to serve as an OVA provider and therefore uh, reduces the medical risk for that person. Um, the current rules in the US, though, strongly channel people into gestational surrogacy, which is a more expensive and more risk medically risky form of surrogacy. And for these reasons, again, I think reconsideration and further discussion is warranted and helpful. It may be that after further reconsideration, um, a decision is made to stay the course, continue to treat them differently, um, but again, I, I think that it's one, um, and maybe this forum is the, the very place to have that conversation. Um, and with that, I will, I will end my remarks, um, and I look forward to questions and comments.